Hello, my class. Okay, so we're back with Island of the Blue Dolphins, and I will be reading chapter two. Captain Orlov and his Aleut hunters moved to the island that morning, making many trips from their ship to the beach of Coral Cove. Since the beach was small and almost flooded when the tide was in, he asked if he could camp on higher ground. This my father agreed to. Perhaps I should tell you about our island so you will know how it looks and where our village was and where the Aleuts camped for most of the summer. Our island is two leagues long and one league wide, and if you were standing on one of the hills that rise in the middle of it, you would think that it looked like a fish, like a dolphin lying on its side with its tail pointing toward the sunrise, its nose pointing at the sunset, and its fins making reefs and the rocky ledges along the shore. Whether someone did stand there on the low hills in the days when the earth was new and because of its shape called it the island of the blue dolphins, I do not know. Many dolphins live in our seas, and it may be from them that the name came, but one way or another, this is what the island was called. The first thing you would notice about our island, I think, is the wind. It blows almost every day, sometimes from the northwest and sometimes from the east, once in a long while out of the south. All the winds, except the one from the south, are strong, and because of them, the hills are polished smooth, and the trees are small and twisted, even in the canyon that runs down to Coral Cove. The village of Galisad lay east of the hills on a small mesa, near Coral Cove, and a good spring. About a half league to the north is another spring, and it was there that the Aleuts put up their tents, which were made of skins, and were so low to the earth that the men had to crawl into them on their stomachs. At dusk, we could see the glow of their fires. That night, my father warned everyone in the village of Galisat against visiting the camp. The Aleuts come from a country far to the north, he said. Their ways are not ours, nor is their language. They have come to take otter and to give us share in many goods which they have and which we can use. In this way we shall profit, but we shall not profit if we try to befriend them. They are people who do not understand friendship. They are not those who were here before, but they are people of the same tribe that caused trouble many years ago. My father's words were obeyed. We did not go to the Aleut camp and they did not come to our village. But this is not to say that we did not know what they did, what they ate and in what way they cooked it, how many otter were killed each day and other things as well. For someone was always watching from the cliffs while they were hunting or from the ravine when they were in camp. Rommel, for instance, brought news about Captain Orlov. In the morning when he crawls out of his tent, he sits on a rock and combs until the beard shines like a cormorant's wing, Rommel said. My sister, Ulape, who was two years older than I, gathered the most curious news of all. She swore that there was an Aluk girl among the hunters. She is dressed in skins just like the men, Ulape said, but she wears a fur cap and under the cap she has thick hair that falls to her waist. No one believed Dulape. Everyone laughed at the idea that the hunters would bother to bring their wives with them. The Aleuts also watched our village. Otherwise, they would not have known about the good fortune which befell us soon after they came. It happened in this way. Early spring is a poor season for fishing. The heavy seas and winds of winter drive the fish into deep water, where they stay until the weather is settled and where they are hard to catch. During this time, the village eats sparingly, mostly from stores of seeds harvested in autumn. Word of our good fortune came on a stormy afternoon, brought by Ulape, who was never idle. She had gone to a ledge on the eastern part of the island hoping to gather shellfish. She was climbing a cliff on the way home when she heard a loud noise behind her. At first she did not see what had caused the noise. She thought that it was the wind echoing through one of the caves, and was about to leave when she noticed silvery shapes on the floor of the cove. The shapes moved, and she saw that it was a school of large white bass, which prey upon them when seals are not to be found. Oh, each one as big as she was. Pursued by killer whales, which prey upon them when seals are not to be found, the bass had tried to escape by swimming toward shore. But in their terror, they had mistaken the depth of the water and had been tossed onto the rocky ledge. Ulape dropped her basket of shellfish and set out for the village, arriving there so out of breath that she could only point in the direction of the shore. The women were cooking supper, but all of them stopped and gathered around her, waiting for her to speak. 
A school of white bass, she finally said. Where, where, everyone asked. On the rocks. A dozen of them. Perhaps more than a dozen. Before Alope, Alope had finished speaking, we were running toward the shore, hoping that we would get there in time, that the fish had not flopped back into the sea, or that a chance wave had not washed them away. We came to the cliff and looked down. The school of white bass was still on the ledge, glistening in the sun. But since the tide was high, and the biggest waves were already lapping at the fish, there was no time to lose. One by one, we hauled them out of reach of the tide. Then two women carrying a single fish, for they were all about the same size and heavy. We lifted them up the cliff and brought them home. There were enough for everyone in our tribe for supper that night and the next. But in the morning, two Aleuts came to the village and asked to speak to my father. You have fish, one of them said. Enough only for my people, my father answered. You have fourteen fish, the Aleut said. Seven now, because we ate seven. From seven you can spare two. There are forty in your camp, my father replied, and more than that of us. Besides, you have your own fish, the dried ones that you bought, brought. We tire of that kind, the Aleut said. He was a short man who only came to my father's shoulders, and he had eyes like black pebbles and a mouth like the edge of a stone knife. The other Aleut looked very much like him. You are hunters, my father said. Go and hunt your own fish if you are tired of what you are now eating. I have my people to think of. Captain Orlov will hear that you refuse to share the fish. Yes, tell him, my father said, but also why we refuse. The Aleut grunted to his companion, and the two of them stalked off on their short legs across the sand dunes that lay between the village and their camp. We ate the rest of the white bass that night, and there was much rejoicing. But little did we know, as we ate and sang, and the older men told stories around the fire, that our good fortune would soon bring trouble to Galasat. And that was chapter two. And we'll continue tomorrow. All right. Have a great day.